Many of you like the videos that we are doing. You appreciate the content. Well, because you do so, click the like button. And then you want to continue to get these videos coming your way. Well, it's good to press that subscribe button. And if you really want to get that information right as it is released, and then press that notification button. Looking forward to seeing you again. Take care until next video. And we are very much acquainted with the work that he's doing at his Biblical Research Institute. And folks, let me just say for myself, I have been able to look over a lot of his work and I'm talking about deep scholarly work. And I, and, and I just don't want to say only deep and scholarly, but very, very spiritual and spirit led. And so when we get such a man to, to share his knowledge with us um, and to humbly do so, we need to thank God for the grace that he would have bestowed on these people, people like himself, to share with God's people such wonderful insights into the scripture. So we, we want to thank God for him. We want to thank God for his wife and son, his entire family. We really thank you for lending yourself for this entire weekend. I mean, we are partnering in this initiative together. And so we want to thank God for him. You could see God keep, keep him. He always looking young and sharp. So we thank God for that. We have that going for him. And so we want to give God praise this morning. I want to pray. And we want to solicit the presence of God on this platform and let me just assure you that uh we have folks that are looking at his youtube channel my youtube channel on facebook facebook was beaming up last night and this morning folks are there so we have a lot of folks hundreds of folks who benefited from this uh presentations that began that began last night and will continue today so let's just talk to god father god um this is some really hard stuff and we we have to appreciate that it is coming from a worldview where you saw things completely different. And so, yes, you're going to have some cognitive dissonance taking place between our, ourselves, you know, trying to rationalize and put it together. And some would want to just immediately reject while others are saying, let me just listen, see where this thing is going. And others who are just embracing it and say, I saw this uh, this way a long time ago, or, or God has really revealed it to me. Father, we pray for nothing else more than the leading of your Holy Spirit. And we are guaranteed that the way that you would have begun, you would continue there, Father, to show us with your presence and affirmation that that which we are doing is pleasing to God. So I pray there, Father, that you would dispel all distractions in every home there, Father, as people just lend their minds solely to what is being taught by your Holy Spirit even now be with dr baldwin continue to be with him in his utterance and i pray dear father that all our hearts dear father would will will be drawn closer to you as a result of what we, we will receive even now we give you praise and thanks again for your revelation for revealing your knowledge to us because you love us we thank you in jesus name amen and amen and so dr baldwin welcome again and uh, may God continue to use you as you address us at this time. Thank you very much, Pastor Francois, and a pleasant morning to everyone. Hope you had a good night's rest and you are fresh and ready to go again for another installment on uh, this our series resting in jesus i am impressed again just to say a prayer thank you pastor francois for that beautiful prayer i really appreciate it and uh, let us pray pray with me one more time so the lord will just calm my nerves and help me to get through this thing there is so much to get through this morning and uh, i really need to get going let us pray father god in heaven i want to thank you for this morning again Thank you for the privilege to share, God. Jesus, as you come, as we come, may your spirit be here. May this not simply be a theological or academic exercise, but more importantly, may it be an encounter with Jesus. May your spirit speak through me now. May the words of Jesus come through. May my thoughts, O oh God, be 
controlled and governed by your Holy Spirit. And uh, may this city, O God, be a blessing. Those who are to hear and to understand, may clarity, O God, and uh, conversion and renewal be realized as we look at the words of Jesus. As we come to draw closer to you, thank you for drawing closer to us and blessing this exercise. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. Let's get right into it. Let's get right into it. And uh, it's a little ways to go. And I just ask you to fasten your seatbelts and to enjoy. Last night, we did a Sabbath keeping commanded in Genesis. And we discovered that certainly not. In Genesis, the Sabbath is not commanded. In fact, Genesis is not a basis, any intelligent basis for pushing Sabbath keeping. Are we together? You cannot substantiate the keeping of Sabbath from Genesis. Why? There was no command in Genesis to keep the Sabbath. Sabbath in Genesis did not occur as a recurring pattern. It was a one-time experience, and God did not command it on Adam and Eve. You can assume it, and it's not a reasonable assumption. And even if you assume it, you cannot base the membership of individual where they work, where they're married, based on an assumption not fear, not right at all. It wasn't commanded there. An argument from silence is never a valid one. So Genesis is out through the window because Genesis is not the greatest revelation of God in human history. The Christ event, which we look at this morning, is a greater revelation of God in human history. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, you can't afford to miss it. This afternoon, Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. Ten Commandments and Ten Commandments, man. That is a trump card. That is a pillar that nobody dare touch. Hey, this afternoon we're going to look at the Ten Commandments again. We're going to realize that uh, we are reading into Scripture and we are really replacing Jesus with Ten Commandments. That's what's really happening in many quarters. They're replacing Jesus with Ten Commandments. And this afternoon we're going to show that all of that is attributed to Ten Commandments, the Bible really attributed them to Jesus. You can't afford to miss this afternoon. What time again, that's Pastor Francois, five o'clock Eastern, four o'clock in some quarters like Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow evening, Sunday evening, please, the apostles, the Pope, Saturday, Sunday debate. Mm -hmm. And that's where the rubber hits the road again. So we have great stuff lined up, and this morning is no exception. Why under God, heavens, Pastor Baldwin, Pastor Francois, and others, do you take time out to be talking about Sabbath? Mm? Well, leave people to worship when they want to worship and do what they want to do. Why are you coming talking about Sabbath? Is anybody hearing me, by the way? Hello, give me a shout out, somebody. Yes, we are. Amen. Preach oh, on. Oh. Yes, Thank yes. You, Jesus. At least one person here. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Listen, people, when you respond to the preacher, you're helping him to communicate. Okay. So thank you for responding. Appreciate it. We are here to worship and worship is a participatory sport. It's not just what you get, but what you give in the process. Amen. So come, let's worship together as we study the word. So talk back to me when I talk back to you. Okay. You are now in the stands and you are cheering on the team. And the team will really perform if you cheer on. All right? So please, see this worship. See this worship. What is irrelevance, Jesus? What is irrelevance? Why you not know, leave people to do what they want to do? No. If somebody tells you that you must stop work on a particular day and keep it sacred and don't do anything, and it's the Lord's holy day, it affects your employment because certain jobs you cannot keep. Mm. And if you're out of a job and life hard and tough and you get a job and many people just give up the job and go through the grind in the name of obeying Jesus. You know, God is so wonderful and so loving that despite the fact that people go to that extra sacrifice, he still blesses them despite it, you know. But guess what? 
The Lord in such instances is blessing your faith, not your theology. Your theology is still wrong. I firmly believe I will demonstrate this morning. So if it is relevant because of your job, your job impacts on your health. Your job impacts on where you live. Hmm? Your job impacts on the quality of life you live every day. And the Sabbath impacts both. Huh? Your education, the type of schooling you can get. There are many people going to universities and colleges, etc., and they cannot take exams on Saturdays, and maybe some even Sundays. Mm, and they have to study later and doing all sorts of things, all doing it in faith. But does God require of us to exercise unnecessary sacrifice? It impacts your family relationship moving on. So the question of the Sabbath is very important. Am I right? Impact your career choices, division in the body of Christ, your assurance of salvation. It is a very vital topic, important topic. Let's move on. As such, therefore, the objective of this seminar is to outline the position that the New Testament presents Jesus as the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Hence, Sabbath keeping is no longer the observance of a day, but the observance of a person, Jesus Christ. Hmm? The Sabbath has to do with the observance of a person, Jesus Christ. And oh Lord, there are still many of my friends when I tell them that Jesus is the Sabbath, they laugh at me and say, what fool is this Baldwin is talking about? Help us, Jesus. Let's move on. We are not here this morning to put down anyone. Amen. My motive is not to bash, to disparage, or to attack Sabbatarians. I have close, very close family members who are Sabbatarians, and they are good people, and I love them. Mm, and I have many friends who are Sabbatarians as well. Granted, many of them really can't associate too close with me still, but they are still friends, and they are wonderful people in Sabbatarian churches. They are Christian people. They are loving people. They do not hold on to the Sabbath because they want to be bad. Granted, many of them think that people who hold on to sun and other days are because they are deceived by the devil because they want to be bad. Ah, but we are not. We, we are not here to return the favor. I do not believe that people who are genuine Sabbatarians are bad people or people who are telling lies, etc. No, they are genuine Christian people and they mean well. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we want to come in love as we present, as we talk about the topic, because one of the things that we've got to recognize, my brothers and sisters, and those of you who may be Sabbatarians listening to me, is that when you accept the Sabbath, Jesus, when you come into the Ten Commandments uh, arena and accept Sabbath, etc., etc., and when somebody like a Baldwin or a Francois or whoever, Mm, should come and say, you know something, Jesus is a Sabbath. And there's a different way to keep Sabbath. Guess what? Deep inside of your bowels, you get nervous. You get angry. You have cognitive dissonance. You feel frustrated. And you just want to shut them up and get rid of them. What if I have a weakness in the house? Hmm? I was in church, I would have a weakness. I could see it on the face. I'm not seeing any face, Jesus, but I'm trusting Jesus that I'm having a weakness this morning. Mm, you feel as if, my Amen. Lord, man, these people are mad people, you know. And some may believe that, why they have the devil, you know. And that's how Sabbath, uh, Sabbatarians feel when you tell them that the Sabbath is resting in Christ. It is something that has become a part of their identity identity and they are ready to defend it at all costs and anybody say that must be of the devil people have been having fasting and prayer for me and the lord poor brother baldwin dr baldwin has lost his way jesus help him mm, have mercy on him jesus and brothers and sisters do not listen to him brothers and sisters do not go his way he's deceived he's of the devil Stand firm, brothers and sisters. It's the last hours. That's how Sabbatarians feel. And they're genuine about it. 
So we're going to pity them. They have what is called cognitive dissonance. Nothing can be more devastating to a Sabbatarian person if you tell them that the Sabbath is not mandatory. Nothing is more devastating. Nothing in the field of religion. So we're going to understand their psychology and we've got to have compassion. We've got to have love. We've got to have patience. And uh, we've got to recognize that we who see otherwise, we are also human beings and we have failures. Have I said enough on this part of this topic? In light of what I've just said, my brothers and sisters, and hear me well, hear me well. I want to make another call and I'll be doing it throughout the presentations to Sabbatarian scholars to level with your members regarding the truth about the Sabbath. Sabbatarian scholars, those of you in the university setting, those of you who have PhD in New Testament studies and biblical studies, Old Testament studies, etc., and you know that 99.99% of the texts and passages used to support the Sabbath are just from the proof text variety, and the whole construct is wrong. I'm going to call upon you, yes, in the name of Jesus, to stand firm. And I know this may not be politically correct. And some of you may hate my guts for saying this, but I'm going to say it in love and respect. In love and respect, I call upon Sabbatarian Bible scholars to at least level with the members in a more vocal way. Level with the pastors. Many pastors do not know. And some of the pastors do know. Hello. Hello. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. As brothers and sisters, the responsibility for one another. So we will constructively evaluate this principle growth in all aspects of life. Let's get into it, Clinton. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. How are we doing with time? Mm. Wow, we haven't started yet. What is your hermeneutic? When you are about to study any topic from the Bible, you must first make an evaluation of your hermeneutic. What are you talking about hermeneutic? That's only like a big word to me. No, it's a very small word. It is a word that has to do with your method of Bible study. Every time you open the Bible to study it, you are using a particular method, whether or not you realize it. The moment you open the Bible, if you read the Bible and read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you automatically use a particular method of interpretation to understand it. And if you are not aware of the method you are using, you are arriving at conclusion without knowing why you arrived at the conclusion, how you arrived at the conclusion, and the nature of the conclusion you arrived at. Huh? Last night, we looked at the fact that a basic principle is that we must first determine what the Bible meant in its primary historical context before we can determine what it means. And there are many different dimensions to context, right? There are many different dimensions of context. There's textual context, there's linguistic context, there's historical context, there's philosophical context, there's theological context, and all of these take an entire book by itself. So I can only mention them now and again. Method of biblical interpretation, how to interpret scripture. I think I'm almost out of copies now. I'll try to get some copies back on the market. I deal with the topic in a very simple, nice way. And there are other books in other bookstores too that go in further details. Huh? But it's very important that you know your approach to interpreting the Bible. Very, very important. Context, context, context. And context does not mean reading the text before the text afterwards. Context means is a multiple entity. Context is a plural phenomenon. There is a textual context what the author wrote. The linguistic context is style of writing, is use of words, is genre of writing. Uh, is it prose? Is it apocalyptic? Uh, what are literary styles he's using? And so much more. The historical context, what was happening at the time of writing? To whom was the text written? Uh, the philosophical worldview, how did the author view reality? The theological orientation, what is the understanding of God and reality? And all the works has to be taken into consideration in order to determine what the Bible meant back then before we can make applications today. I dare submit to you that 
the distillation of Sabbath and the position taken on Sabbath by the average Sabbatarian did not take all of these contexts into consideration. But this morning, we will take all of those into consideration and we will look at Jesus and the Sabbath. Jesus and the Sabbath is often claimed that because Jesus kept the Sabbath, then the Sabbath is obligated to upon all Christians for all times and places. Have you ever heard this before? Anyone in the room? Talk to me, somebody. Yes, yes, doc. Oh, okay. yes. wonderful. It is often claimed that because Jesus kept the Sabbath, then the Sabbath is obligatory on all Christians. Is this a fair conclusion? Mm. All somebody else will tell you, you know, Jesus kept the Sabbath. The apostles kept the Sabbath. How on the God heavens can you say that the Sabbath as a day is not mandatory at every single Sabbatarian in church this morning? They will say, you watch Baldwin and all of those people like Francois and Thunder and Branner and Reed and the Baldwins and the Coles. They don't realize that Jesus kept the Sabbath. How in the God earth, brothers and sisters, Jesus kept the Sabbath. Therefore, stand for Help me, Jesus. Is it a fear conclusion? Again, when you study the Bible in context, uh, you're going to come to a different conclusion. You see? Let me say, forget to this slide. I don't have it in slide here, but hear me well. Jesus was our example in all things, but not necessarily in the physical expression or the literal expression of all things. One more time. Jesus was our example in all things, but not necessarily in the literal ex expression of everything. What am I talking about? This sounds outrageous, but let's get into it. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus lived as a Jew all his life. As a practicing Jew, Jesus kept the entire Torah. This is a basic truth. It's very, very important, you know, but most people do not understand. Jesus was a what? Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He lived as a Jew all his life. That is packed with tons of meaning, brothers and sisters. It's not just a simple statement. I have a book on my shelf here. Is it there? Yeah. Written by one of the top New Testament scholars, some noted in Mirror Jesus, the, uh, the, the, the Jew. Volumes upon volumes just on the topic of Jesus being a Jew. So we need an entire semester right now to, un, to, 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 to go to the depth of, to, to unplug the fact, the reality that Jesus is a Jew. Tons of information on that. Implications are many, many, many. He lived as a Jew all his life. And as a practicing Jew, he kept the entire what? Torah. The entire law. In that sense, therefore, by the way, when we say kept the entire Torah, we are talking about all of the laws in the Old Testament, Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's what, in a narrow sense, meant the Torah, the law, the entire legal system of the Old Testament. Hmm? Jesus kept all of them. Let's look at some examples. Jesus was circumcised. Luke 2, 21, and when the days were completed for his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was, convinced he was conceived in the womb. Jesus was circumcised. God allowed his son to be circumcised. Mm. So if Jesus was our example in all things, and Jesus was circumcised, 
then every Christian today should be circumcised. Therefore, we've got to attack a man called Paul, who dared to say in Romans chapter 2, Galatians 5, etc., that circumcision is either here or not here. How wonder God heavens could Jesus be circumcised? He be the example in all things. And Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, is saying that circumcision is neither here nor there. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, Paul said those who are pushing circumcision I wish the knife would slip and cut off everything. So Jesus was going against, I mean, Paul was going against Jesus, man. Hmm? Jesus was made to participate in the purity rites of childbirth. You know what that is? Luke 2.22 referring to Leviticus chapter 12 and other places, and when the days of their purification of corn, the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. When the days of their purification according to what? The law of Moses were completed. He brought them to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Speaking about Mary and Joseph and Jesus. As it is written in the law of the Lord. By the way, look at the parallelism and the alternate use between the words law of Moses and law of the Lord. Mm. Every firstborn male that opened the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer sacrifice. To offer what? A sacrifice. According to what is written in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle dove and two young pigeons. Hey, that is what people today call ceremonial offerings and ceremonial laws, offering turtle doves and pigeons. Jesus engaged in that. And not only that, as a child, he was made to participate in all of those Levitical laws, but when he grew up as a big man, he endorsed sac the sacrificial system. Ah, Jesus was my example in all things, so I should be offering a sacrifice today of a lamb, you know. In Matthew 5, 23, 24, if therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go your way first, be reconciled to your brother, then present your offering. Uh, offering doesn't really mean collection there, you know. It means animal sacrifices too. That's another example. In Matthew 8 and verse 4, Jesus recommended animal sacrifice. He said to them, see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priests and present the what? The offering that Moses commanded for a testament to them. Jesus here healed the crippled man, and Jesus could say to the man, go home. Mm. But Jesus said to the man, go to the temple and present what? The offering that Moses commanded. Many times we read the Bible, we gloss over these statements, you know, without looking at the deeper meaning. Go and present the offering that Moses commanded. Go show yourself to the priest at the temple, one, that's Judaism, present the offering that Moses commanded. What was the offering that Moses commanded? It's found in Leviticus chapter 14, 1 through to 5 and onwards. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out to the house of the camp. Thus the priest shall look at, at and if the infection of leprosy has been healed, in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and clean cedar woods and a scarlet string and hyssop for the one who has been cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay one bird in an earth where vessels over running water. Mm -hmm. And for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and hyssop and shall dip them in the, and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. And he shall sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean. My goodness gracious. Jesus sent the man to go and do something. When you read the passage carefully, it's tantamount to what was done on the day of atonement. Two animals chosen, one was set free, one was killed, 
dipped in water, water sprinkled, etc. It's an elaborate sacrificial system. And Jesus could send the man to go home. But Jesus a Jew, and within the Jewish context, that's what you do. Jesus, moving on, Jesus recommended the tithing system, Jewish tithing system. Mm. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Are you saying people shouldn't pay tithe and offering, Pastor? No, no, not so fast. Woe to you, Pharisees. You do what? You pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disrespect, disregard justice and love of God. But these things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the front seat in the synagogues and the respect greets in the marketplaces. You pay tithe of what? Mint and rue and every kind of garden herb. Jesus recommended the tithing system. The tithing system is not like what is in church today. You know. What we practice in modern times is that we give one-tenth of our salary for tithe. That's not tithe. Mm -hmm. That's not tithe in the Bible. In the Bible, tithe is never from salary. And the people worked salaries then. Yes, money was in circulation in the time of Christ and before from Old Testament times. But tithing is not from salary. Tithing is not a monetary return. Tithing is like what you see here in Matthew and Luke 11. Mint, rule, every kind of garden herb. Tithing was an agricultural offering. Mm. And tithing, when you read the text pertaining to tithing in Deuteronomy 12 and lived across 25 and Malachi chapter 3 and many other places, every time you see tithe, in the same context, you see sacrifices and votive offerings and burnt offerings. In other words, if you're going to push tithe, you must also push sacrifice and burnt offering and votive offerings because they're all in the same package. Mm hmm? Every time tithe is mentioned in the Old Testament, many other ceremonial offerings and sacrifices are mentioned in the same context. And note that with ceremonial quotes and quotes. And there shall be bring and look, leave it called Deuteronomy chapter 12. And there you shall bring your what? Your burnt offering, your sacrifices, your tithe to the land. So Jesus recommended the sacrificial tithing system. That was a ceremonial thing, so to speak. It's not required on Christians today. And sad to say, there are many Christians, as I like to put it, they go to church every morning and they pick up their basket of guilt with a man wrap. God, you've wrapped me in tithe and offering. Malachi like chapter 3, A through to 10, and say, Oh, Jesus, I didn't pay the tithe this week. Have mercy on my soul. I try and make it up next week. And next week, you fail again. Bam! And I go to church and they read it again on you. They say, Ah, oh, Jesus, man, help me, God. I must return your holy tithe and guilt and burn and flick your soul. Unnecessary. The New Testament does not teach tithing from salary, it does not teach tithing at all. I remember, you know, in 2017, when I left the Adventist church, this good, good gentleman, good brother, you know him personally, you know, I can call his name because he's out there in public. Thing is, Gillins is the name, or Gittins, from Mandeville. And he came and he made a YouTube to rebut Baldwin, debunked the word he used, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I hope you will listen to some of these presentations because very interesting, you know, very interesting. Subsequent to you rebutting me, I, someone sent me a YouTube and said, look at this, Baldwin. Killings has left the Adventist church or given up his membership, not left, given his membership in the church. He's still worshiping with the church, he said then. I don't know what is the case now. But he gave up his members in church. And why was he giving up his membership in the church? He gave up his membership because he then came to realize that the tithing system as presented by the Adventist church is not biblical. And so he could not associate the church any further. I wish my brother would apply the same hermeneutic for tithing to the Sabbath. Mm, because the same principles, my brother, that you throw the tithing system, you should throw the mandatory Sabbath keeping the same principle. And if you had read my book from that time, 2017, when you were debunking me, you'd have realized long before you came to realize it three, two, three years later, the tithing is not mandatory. 
Am I saying that one ought not to give to the church? This is the problem again now. Sometimes we keep people these truths, you know, and they get stingy on the other side and they don't give anything to God's work. My brothers, the Bible doesn't teach tithe. They teach that 100% of all that you have belongs to God. 100%. It's not one-tenth is holy. It's 100% is holy. Therefore, when you get your money, not one cent belongs to you. Whoops. Whoops. When Amen. you get your money, not even one cent belongs to you. You have no right to take a cent when you get your money. It all belongs to God. Mm, guess what? Some people are hearing me to say right now that when you get your money, you must give 100% to the church. Did I say that? No. No. I did not say no. That. I said it belongs to God. You return everything to him. And in other words, when you get your money, you realize that, hey, I'm a steward of God's money. I must spend it. Dispense of it as the spirit would have me dispense of it. So how should I spend God's money? Ah, I should give something to the poor because he that lendeth to the poor lends the God. Ah, he that lendeth to the poor lends the God. So I budget a section for the poor. Mm, I budget a section for my children. The least you do unto the least of these you do unto me. Mm, you budget a section to buy some food for your body because the body is God's temple. Are you with me? You put just a section to help with the work of God. That's the church now and the community work now because the church is the body of Christ. Huh? So you cannot be careless with your money. Any of it, you see, and if God's giving you help and you're not giving a portion to the different dimension of God's cause, so to speak, then you're not spending your money right. Huh? So let's not say because you ought not to be paying tithes, you ought not to be supporting the work of God. I think I'm clear on this point. Can we move on? We Amen. want to point that Jesus uh, recommended tithing system which was not a part of the Ten Commandments. So those who are saying God's law equals Ten Commandments, even on that ground as well, stop being tied. So you can recognize the purity laws moving on. What to you conceal tombs? People who walk over them, that's according to another ceremonial system. Jesus paid the temple tax. You know the story? When the Pharisees said to Jesus, is this Jesus, uh, why aren't your disciples paying the temple tax? What did Jesus do? Jesus said, oh, come on, go away with your temple tax business that's coming from Leviticus and, you know, the Old Testament. No, Jesus said what in Matthew 17, go to the sea, cast a hook, take up the fish, the first one come, open the mouth, you find some money, go pay the temple tax. Jesus even worked a miracle to keep the Old Testament ceremonial law. You know what was the temple tax? It was a sacrifice of atonement. But my Jesus, Jesus knew he was the atoning sacrifice of God. He was going to make an atoning atonement for the sins of the people. Why pay a tax? A ceremonial offering based on Leviticus chapter 30 and other places which was a sacrifice of atonement. When you have time, read Exodus 30, 15, and 16. You shall take the atonement money. What money? The atonement money from the sons of Israel, and you shall give it for the service, give for the, service, the tent of meeting. Atonement money to make an atonement for yourselves. Exodus 13, read from verse 10 onwards. So Jesus did all of those quotes and quotes ceremonial things as a Jew. And within that same context, Jesus also, and I put quotes and quotes, the quotes and quotes, kept the Sabbath. We're going to drill on to what that means. He came to Nazareth. Where he's been brought up and his custom was, he entered where? 
the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up for to read. I remember as a youngster in the church, as a little boy, 12, 13, 14, going to primary school, going to high school, man. And when my friends come and say to me that Sunday is a Sabbath, I would pull Luke 4, 16 through to 18 on them. And I said, see it is, Jesus, as his custom was, mm, he went to sing on the Sabbath day. Do you want it clearer than that? Sad to say that this text, most Sabbatarians do not know the context of this text. Have just read Luke 4, 16 alone, just with a blinkers on. Don't look at the sociological, I mean, uh, theological, linguistic, and background meaning to the text. All they know is that Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, therefore the Sabbath ought to be kept. That with all due respect, is a lazy way to study God's words. And God is crying and is embarrassed because God is saying that my children just can't read the verses at bottom and top. My children can't read the background context. How oh, my children, them too lazy, man. What's going on? I'm going to ask again, Sabbatarian Bible scholars, Please help your members to see that Luke 4, 16 to 18 is not a very good text to support the Sabbath. When we read it in context, let me back up here and say, you know, that most Sabbatarians know their theology, particularly on the Sabbath, hear me well, was hammered out by a number of, uh, with all respect now, a few white people in the New England states of the United States, a few white people uh, like James White, Ellen White, etc., people who have no clue as to how to study the Bible in context, etc., etc., and they did the best they could. They were genuine, sincere Christian people. They loved God, and I firmly believe that when they go to heaven, you're going to see many of them there. Why? They did the best they could with what they had, but they could not read Hebrew. They could not read Greek. They had no archaeological background and studies and linguistic studies and all the science and art of biblical studies, which are taught in Adventist universes and colleges today. They never had that. Ask any Seventh-day Adventist Bible scholar. And they will tell you that Ellen White's method of Bible study was proof texting. Every time I use this word, I have to explain them you know, because my brother jumped on me when I said proof texting and said, hey, what do you mean by proof texting? Proof texting simply means taking text out of context, using the wrong text to make a point or reading into the text, etc. Of course, you can find a text to prove your position. But if when you find a text to substantiate your point, the text must be saying in its context, what you are trying to communicate. You should not be reading into the text, but read out of the text. So the text in its theological, linguistic, sociological, cultural context is making the point that you want to communicate, then that's okay. Proof texting mean you take the text out of context like what they do with Luke 4, 16 through the hate in Jesus. Jump into it some more, Clinton. But so Jesus kept the Sabbath. Yes, he kept the Sabbath too. What does that mean? Let's move on. He observed the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, that's a ceremonial Sabbath, you know, man. Read John chapter 7, 10, 34. John, Jesus kept the Feast of Tabernacles. It was always there. It was his custom. When you read John's Gospel carefully, you could all, all it, it says essentially, without using those words, it says essentially that it was the custom of Jesus to keep all the Jewish feasts. Therefore, why aren't most Sabbatarians, just a few now, why aren't most Sabbatarians keeping the Feast of Booths and Tabernacles, etc.? It was Jesus' example to keep all of those as well. He kept all of them. Move on. Jesus observed the Passover. Hmm? Observed the Passover. So why are we keeping Passover today? Conclusion. John's gospel demonstrates that as a custom, 
Jesus attended all the Jewish feasts or holy days, not just the Sabbath. Very, very important. Are we still together? Amen. Yes, sir. So if Jesus is, thank you, Jesus is keeping of the seventh day is mandatory, then I beg you in the name of Jesus, be consistent and keep the 14th, 15th to the 21st of Nisan, the specific day. You can't say Jesus fulfilled it. Therefore, you can't keep it because he fulfilled the Sabbath as well. The Feast of Tabernacles. You must therefore keep the 15th to 21st of Tishri. The Day of Atonement, the 10th day of the seventh month. Day of Pentecost, 15th, 16th of Nisan, among other specific days. Because Jesus kept the specific days. Fair enough? Certainly, certainly. Not only should Christians observe these specific days, but they should also offer the specific sacrifices that were prescribed for those days because the sacrifices what gave meaning to the day and be speaking now within Jewish context. Ah. Time in Jewish thought, background now, was not as time in our modern, somewhat Greek way of thinking. Time in Jewish thinking was time content. That which made time, time, was what happened within the time. So the day of atonement is the day of atonement because the atoning sacrifice happened that day. The Sabbath was the Sabbath because of the day of sacrifice. It was a day in which you did something that is you rest, so to speak, an action, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It was associated with some concrete reality. So you must observe the specific days of the specific sacrifices. Thus the argument that Jesus kept the Sabbath Therefore, it ought to be kept is built on faulty premise. Again, Jesus was a Jew who lived and practiced as a Jew, and Sabbath keeping was simply one of his customary Jewish practices, not a practice of his that was meant to be reenacted literally or specifically for all Christians in all times and places. I could virtually stop here, but I know there's a little bit more. Uh, how long have I been going? Mm. Can we continue a little further? Yeah. The point is, Jesus was born under the law. Galatians 4 verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Under the law, there means that Jesus lived under the jurisdiction of the Old Testament legal system. Yes, he was bringing in the new, but in, uh, in, in order to bring in the new thing, he participated in the old, pushed his hands into the gloves of the old, as it were, and turned it inside out. So he became the Lamb of God, so to speak, by participating in the temple system. He changed it by participating in it. That's what was happening in the New Testament. And the later writers like Paul and others, seeing the example of Jesus, they go, ha, ha, ha. And they reinterpreted to realize that mm -hmm, he was circumcised in order to dwell with circumcision. He offered himself as a sacrifice in the past base of the temple. He's going to cleanse the temple in order to put away the temple system. Jesus was very strategic. So did Jesus' observance of these laws meant to legitimize the continued observance of these laws? Or were they intent to, intended to legitimize the person and claims of Jesus? 
What criteria did the early church use to distinguish the customs of Jesus they should follow and which they should abandon? What criteria did the early church use to distinguish the customs of Jesus they should follow and which they should abandon? First of all, the early church and the rest of the New Testament recognized that the entire Old Testament pointed to Jesus and was fulfilled in him. Let's take a pause right here, my brothers and sisters. I invite you to read what is on the screen. Is everybody seeing my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Could somebody, read, could somebody read what is on the screen to me? The entire Old Testament pointed to Jesus and was fulfilled in him. Wow. Now, that sounds simple, you know. But it is a position that many people don't realize, understand, appreciate. The entire Old Testament pointed to Jesus and was fulfilled in him. How do we know that? What does that mean? What are the implications of that? Jesus himself said it. John 5, 39, what does he say there? Can someone read something, please? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these that bear witness of me. Wow. You search the scriptures. I thank you, my sister. You read very loud and clear. Keep your mic open. I'm going to ask to read for me going down some more. You, Jesus is saying to the Jewish leaders, you are searching the scriptures, better translation, because you think in them you have life, but they are there with bear witness of me. And I should have quoted the verse 40, which said, and yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You are searching the scriptures, the indicative there, because you think that in them you have eternal life. But the scriptures do what? Bear witness to me. The phrase there, the scriptures, meant the entire Old Testament. Everything. Jesus was saying, they bear witness to me. They point to me. And by the way, I have on your screen there, and I hope no one is offended by this, I have a white-looking Jesus. As I say to my audience, sometimes at the time, I'm just trying to communicate the point and sometimes visual aid. I'm not advocating a white Jesus. I think of a black Jesus. Yeah, there's a black Jesus. You know, so let's not quarrel over this, all right? It's just a picture to illustrate. The Bible use visual aids, and so we use visual aids from time to time. The discussion pertaining to the image and the picture of who Jesus, a black man or a white man, is for another discussion, right? But we just want to illustrate that. So let's not get sidetracked by that in the body, okay? Fair enough? But all scriptures point to Jesus. Read from again, my sister, Romans 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is a what? The end of the law. The word, Greek word, your end is telos in the Greek. It means the goal, the epitome, the fulfillment. And the word, your law, nomos, means all laws whatsoever. Every law. Christ is the goal, the epitome, the fulfillment. Paul is saying that in keeping what Jesus said. Jesus is the fulfillment fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. Where are we going with this? Where the Sabbath is concerned? Go back to Jesus again, Luke 24, 44. Read again, my, my sister. No, he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Wow. All these things which were spoken of me in where? The law of Moses 
Uh, that's all the five books of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy, the prophets, all the prophetic books, and the psalm, all the poetic books. The Hebrew Bible in the time of Christ up until this day was divided into the law, the prophets, and the psalms. The law, first five books of Moses, the prophet prophets or the prophetic writings, the psalm, all the poetic books like the book of Psalm, the book of Proverbs, uh, I think uh, Lamentations, etc. Ecclesiastes, all of those. So that was three divisions of the Jewish Bible. And Jesus is here saying the entire Jewish Bible pointed to him and was fulfilled in him, particularly at his cross. At the cross, Jesus said what? John 19.30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he mm -hmm. bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Wow. It is finished. Tetelestai. Hmm? Same Greek word, same word family of telos, complete, fulfilled, etc. It is finished. Referring to the entire Old Testament and human history, so to speak, was fulfilled in him. So the entire Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus. So let's think about it. The Sabbath is a part of the Old Testament. So if the entire Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus, the Sabbath must be fulfilled in Jesus as well. Is that logical, my brothers, or something gone with my brain? Talk to me, somebody. If Jesus fulfilled the entire Old Testament and the Sabbath is a part of the Old Testament, then he fulfilled the Sabbath as well. And that is a problem with many Sabbatarians. They see Jesus as fulfilling just the ceremonial law, every other thing in the Old Testament except the Sabbath. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Jesus fulfilled. And guess what? One of the reasons why they say Jesus doesn't fulfill the Sabbath, because the Sabbath only points back to creation. That's wrong. The Sabbath pointed backwards and forwards. There is a book, uh, I, the first time I came across this, around 1986-87, by Samuel Bakioki, Divine Rest for Human Restlessness. In many times, they have in his bookstores. The book is being sold right now. Go and read it, people. It's in your literature. The Sabbath points both backwards and forwards. Adventist scholars, please help me to tell your people because they will hear it from you. They will not want to hear it from Clinton Baldwin. But everybody who have any knowledge of New Testament, Old Testament studies will tell you the Sabbath points backwards and forwards. Why under God, heavens, Clinton, Baldwin, and others should be saying this alone? And when the scholars tell your people, man, it does only point back to creation. It also point forward to the messianic rest in Jesus Christ, man. It's basic to Bible study. And I'm asking my very zealous brothers and sisters, particularly in the land of Adventism, Jamaica, Gillings and Gilpin and all of you who are so strong, please, I invite you to study the position that the Sabbath points both backwards and forwards. That is basic to Bible study. And I can't go into all the proof of it just now, but I just want to throw it out there so that somebody among the things and pastors who know this, please tell the members, help me please. Because the brain is just cued and it's about to spawn backwards to creation. No. It points to creation, backwards creation, Exodus, but it's also points forward to Jesus, and it's all over the Old Testament, because guess what? Uh, when the Sabbath points backward to Exodus, the Exodus experience, the coming out of Egypt, was all a symbol of the new Exodus to be found in Jesus. So the Sabbath points to the Exodus. The point is, the Exodus points to Jesus. Hello? 
And I wish I had time to develop on this. I can give you one text in passing and move on. Luke 9, 35, when Moses and Elijah came to Jesus, the English says they speak of his departure, which is about to happen at Jerusalem. The word therefore departure is the Greek word exodus. In other words, the death of Jesus is seen as a new exodus. Hello? Hmm. I skip here, should have the slide. The first five chapters of Matthew. When look at the first five chapters of Matthew, you know. Oh Lord, man, and this is very much in many cemetery and literature. The first five chapters of Matthew is what is called a midrash from the Exodus, in which Matthew is presenting Jesus as a new Moses who came out of Egypt after a death decree from a new Pharaoh, Herod. And then coming of Egypt from a death decree, he, he went into the waters of baptism, the Jordan, parallel Israel's coming through the Red Sea. And from the Jordan, he went went up to the mount, uh, to the sermon on the mount, a mirror of Moses, as it were, who went on the mountain to receive the Torah, Ten Commandments plus. Huh? So Matthew is saying that here comes a new Moses. Here comes a new Israel. And he's given his law. And so Jesus, as God gave the law on Sinai, so Jesus gave his new law in which he said, you have heard that it was said, but I am now saying to you. Very, very interesting that when you read Matthew chapter 5, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with the Old Testament legal system. It's a transformation of it. And this afternoon we get more into the nitty-gritty of that. But Jesus is the new exodus. Uh, one of my teachers, John Paul, in his book, I have it here, The Deep Things of God. And I did many courses with him. One of the things that we discuss in class every day, man. Jesus is the new Exodus. So the Sabbath points to Exodus, and Jesus is the new Exodus, and the Sabbath points to Jesus. Uh, the Sabbath points backward to creation, but get what? The Bible says Genesis creation points to Jesus. Read for me, my sister, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Okay, I read, for by him are all things were created, both in the heavens and in the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and what? And for him, Jesus is the new creation of God. So the Sabbath points to creation, it is point to Jesus. Huh? Therefore, if any man is in Christ and Christo, the new creation, the text can be translated that way. There is no verb to be in there. There's no is. He is is not there. If any man in Christ, hoste etes en Christo kine kitis. If any man is in Christ, the new creation. In other words, Christ is a new creation of God. In Jesus, God start over again from Genesis chapter one. He's a new creation of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, in Deuteronomy 12, verse 9, the Sabbath points forward to the rest of the children of Israel should have in Canaan. And we could twin this with Daniel 9, uh, 25 onwards, with the Sabbath there again, sabbatical language pointing to the messianic rest. The rest in Canaan, and Jesus came in Luke 4 and other places and said he was the fulfillment of all of that. So the Sabbath points backwards and forwards. Mm. It's a symbol of creation. Who is the creator? Jesus, man. So the Sabbath is a symbol of creation, and Jesus is the creator. And the Sabbath point to Jesus. The Sabbath is a symbol of redemption, Israel's redemption from Egypt. But isn't Israel's redemption from Egypt used in the New Testament to picture the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ? So a symbol of sanctification. Who is our sanctifier? Isn't he Jesus? Mm? The Sabbath the seal of God in the Old Testament. The rest of God, the, the, the everything of God. Come on, man. 
How can you say that Jesus is not the Sabbath? He's not the reality of the Sabbath. How can you say that? My brothers and sisters laugh at me and as if I'm saying something foolish because how can Jesus be a 24-hour period? Is he a sunset and a sunrise? Come on, people. We have more intelligence than that. We have more intelligence than that. No one misunderstands anyone to believe that Jesus is rock stone, a stone. Rock stone is something we say in Jamaican language. Huh? It's a stone when you say he's a rock of ages. Nobody expects Jesus to be literal wood when you say he's a door. Nobody expects Jesus to be literal stone or asphalt or whatever or ground when you say he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one expects Jesus to have four feet when you say he's the Lamb of God. So when you say he is the Sabbath man, it means that all that the day represents he is. He is the fulfillment of it. Hello? So the day represents creation. He is the creator. He represents redemption. He's the redeemer. He represents sanctification. He's our sanctifier. He represents liberation. He's our liberator. He represents rest. Come unto me and I will give you rest. He's the seal of God. He represents the seal of the sign of the covenant. Jesus and his Holy Spirit is our seal. John 6, 27 Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, all that the day represents he is. Jesus is our Sabbath. It found the fulfillment in him. And don't tell me about Matthew 24, da, da, da. What's the text again? That I mean, at your flat in the winter on the Sabbath day. Therefore, come on. In the same text of Matthew 24, we did it last night. Jesus also spoke about <laughs> when you see the abomination of desolation from Adonis standing in the holy place. So he was affirming the temple even after he was dead, so to speak. Mm. I thought about it this morning. And I said, my God, if Jesus was there saying that the Sabbath is mandatory, let not your flight be in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. So Jesus would be 10 times more legalistic than the Jewish leaders, you know. Because in the time of Christ, the Jewish leaders from the time of the Maccabees allowed fight or flight on the Sabbath if life was in danger. So how in the God heavens could Jesus now be saying that, listen, man, you must keep the Sabbath, you know. Because, or, 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 or I mean, the earth is going to be destroyed. You're going to be, I mean, Putin is going to be attacking you in the Herod, so to, in the, the Roman, so to speak. Huh? And don't run. And I'm sorry, you know, that it's going to happen. No, Jesus was simply describing a situation that the Jewish people would make it inconvenient. It's about pregnant women inconvenient for them to run. Why? Because although he was the Sabbath, although he fulfilled the thing, he knew that many of those disobedient Jews would never, still long after, would not come to realize that the days neither here nor there. That's basically what he's talking about. It wasn't a mandate for Sabbath keeping, any at all. Mm. And even if you want to say it's twin to the end of the world, there's much more to that again. But come on, people. Come on, come on, come on. Whoops. You know, I have one more section of this to do because we need to talk about the grain field experience and the... Can we go any further? How you stay? Talk to me, somebody. I've been going for more than an hour. I feel I need to stop now. But we haven't touched yet on the... Green Felix. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Can we go ahead? Okay. Yes. I don't want to wear the saints of the most high, you know. <laughs> Pre preach, preacher, preach, preacher. <laughs> okay, let's see. So I think we have I have one more section to go. And now, well, let me just punch Colossians after two. We're going to deal with Colossians after two. Yeah, this afternoon, yeah, this afternoon, Colossians after two, man. Because Jesus is fulfilling the Sabbath. That's the reason why Paul or the writer of Colossians says that. 
Let no man act of your judge with regards to food or festival or new moon or Sabbath day. Things are mere shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Let no man act as your judge with regard to food or drink, festival or new moon or Sabbath day. Pause here so Clinton right again. Please forgive me. Indulge me, please. But I have to do this. I want to call again upon Sabbatarian scholars to make it commonplace among the membership that this text, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, includes the Sabbath as well. Why am I saying this? Because for generations, Sabbatarians have been schooled have been taught that this passage pertaining to the ceremonial Sabbath, not the seventh day Sabbath. Many of you like the videos that we are doing. You appreciate the content, right? Because you do so, click the like button. And then you want to continue to get these videos coming your way. Well, it's good to press that subscribe button. And if you really want to get that information right as it is released, and then press that notification button. Looking forward to seeing you again. Take care until next video.